morning, afternoon. Um, my name is Alex Cook, and um, I'm a filmmaker, and I have also um, run, I set up a production company making lots of different types of television from documentary to formats. Um, and I volunteer as the chair of a festival called the Sheffield International Documentary Festival. Um, so very committed to the genre. Um, very delighted to be here today with Claire Richards, who's a fantastic filmmaker who's been making documentaries for over 10 years. Um, some very difficult subjects, um, war crimes in Bosnia, um, and some very intimate films, and it's a real honor to be here today with Claire and gonna talk a bit about her work and some of the challenges that she's faced and some of the success she's had in making them. Claire, would you like to introduce yourself a bit and tell us a bit about your work? Um, yeah, so, uh, yeah, my name's Claire Richards. I've been a, a freelancer um, since I was, since I came out of uni. Uh, I, I studied um, history and social sciences at Birmingham Uni. I, I didn't really know about film school um, when I was, you know, choosing what to do at uni. Um, so it, yeah, it, I, it's, it's not it's not essential to to do a, a film course. I guess you know, looking back, would I would I do that now? Probably I would. I've always been freelance, um, and have sort of by hook or by crook managed to stay and work and keep making films. And have had I've had some fantastic opportunities to make some films on you know really important subjects that I've um, you know really enjoyed making. Can you tell us a little bit about how you actually got into filmmaking, how you, how your career progressed? I, um, well, I, I, I came out of uni and thought, oh, how do I, I'd, I'd, I'd done a couple of work experiences at uni. I thought, if I want to get into TV documentary, then I need to do some work experience. And I was at Birmingham, so I had, uh, I got a week on local news and I got a week on, like, Gardner's World Live. I was like, okay, I, I still want to do it. And so after I graduated, I, at the time, there was a book called, uh, there was a, a book that had every single production company in the UK called, it was a packed book, and it was like an alph alphabet book. And I basically went through every uh, production company, and if they had an interest uh, that I was interested in, and I wrote them a letter and said, can I have some work experience? Um, Did anyone give you any work experience? Yes. Yeah, so th this, I got, I got what I, I, I can't remember how many I wrote, tens and tens and tens, and I did that consistently in the first few years. Um, but I got some work experience at a company who were making a an observational documentary series about a about teenagers uh, at school um, in Hebden Bridge, which is just outside Manchester. Um, and I sort of already decided that I couldn't afford to start out in London and that Manchester um, was, was a, would, be a good, would be a good sort of second option, I guess. Um, I, had, I got this work experience and luckily my, because Hebden Bridge was like a 20 minute drive outside Manchester, I had some friends who were studying to be doctors and they were on placement, so there was a spare room. And um, fortunately for me, my dad had lost his driving license, so I had a car that I could use. And, um, I was able to drive to the production company each day and get this, I had three weeks work experience, um, which was really invaluable. But I, I then was able to stay in Manchester because I got a job. My friends who were studying to be doctors were on a graduate email list of sort of jobs. And on one of these graduate emails was, um, they were looking for researchers for a show called um, Bob Monkhouse's Wipeout, which I imagine most of you will have no idea what it is, but it was such a long time ago. But um, they wanted, they were looking for researchers to verify all the questions. It was quiz, it's a quiz show. Um, so I was just chuffed to have a job, um, and it was researching, it was sort of factual researching, and it was sort of early 2000s. And because of that job, they, I got onto a second series of that, and then within that company building, there was another company making um, a, sh a TV program which was hosted by Terry Christian, which again, probably not a lot of you will know who that is, but he was a, a show, like a talk show host, 
and the programme was uh, about looking or finding um, young people who had faith to talk about issues that young people face when, they, when you have faith. And I had to do a lot of casting. And at the time, we were sort of doing street casting. So you would literally just go out on the streets and try and find people who wanted to, that you thought might be interested in what you were doing. So, it, yeah, I, I ended up staying in Manchester for another couple of years, but ultimately ended up coming to London because there wasn't... I, I felt there wasn't going to be enough work for me in Manchester. But I had a, an amazing couple of years in Manchester just sort of trying to find my feet and get a taste of what the industry was like. So how do you go from that sort of jobbing, working, to getting your first opportunity to direct? So it was quite a big risk for somebody to take. Like, what was... How did that happen? I was, at the time, I was working on, um, for a company called RDF, who I'd, I'd sort of grown up with watching, um, you know, faking it um, and Wife Swap, and it was a company that was sort of doing really interesting factual work at the time. So um, I got a job, but it was, it, it was a, a daytime show um, with two presenters doing house extensions, which is basically... A the, sort of the furthest away from what I wanted to do, but it basically gave me a really good um, experience of sort of working to a really tight deadline and just picking at the fo picking at the phone, get practicing picking at the phone and just finding out information, finding people, and you know, just getting the job done basically. But I knew I didn't want to to do it, and I was desperate to try and make my own films and and work on documentaries. So. I, the only way I th thought I could do that was if to get my own idea commissioned. And at the time, there was a, a strand on BBC Three called Fresh, which was for first-time directors. And I had an idea. Um, I found an organisation called um, The Outsiders, which was an, an organisation that helped people with disabilities find partners and, and social network. Um, and I pitched that idea and um, I, got, I got the commission, so I was able to make, you know, my first, you know, my first film at sort of, I was 26, and um, it, it ended up winning an, um, the new, a Grierson Newcomer Award, which then um, meant, which I, so I won 3,000 pounds, and so I was like, oh, amazing, <laughs> um, I can buy a camera, and then, um, you know, then I just went around and sort of tried to shoot anything and everything that was in, in my life and got, you know, really good at shooting. So I um, just got the hours under my belt um, because, I, you know, I wanted to be a self-shooting producer-director. So the film, this, your first film that you won the award for by Curious Me... Is that right? No, it, no, no it was the called second. Disabled and Looking for Love, which I haven't got a clip of because I've sort of chosen other ones, but... So from Fresh, you've done, yeah. you've gone on... So there's a couple of um, first-time director schemes, some still exist, um, but sometimes it's really hard to get your second directing gig after that. Yeah, I mean, I was, a, you know, a, I had a year out of work trying to find directing work, uh, uh, even after I'd won an award f for it um, and obviously shown some, some talent for it. Um, so it was it was really it was difficult it was difficult it was difficult and I think because I had I hadn't done a load of like producing often you go from research to assistant producer to producing and you can fall back on producing um, if you want to or you might not have an option to um, but I hadn't done a lot of that and I hadn't done a lot I hadn't got a lot of contacts in the industry I was still really green and it's kind of come from nowhere uh, so I. I, you know, I, I'm lucky in that I was able to carry on directing over the course of my career. But um, yeah, you, you know, at the beginning, there's big gaps because you just you don't have enough work for people to take you seriously enough, even if you've won a, a newcomer award. So it, it, it took a lot of time, and um, those st you know, it's not just getting your first gig as a director; it's getting your second gig and your third gig. So, but the the by curious me was uh, some time after, I can't remember how long, but it was some time after my first directing gig. So we've got a clip of this um, piece of Claire's called By Curious Me, the film. Um, 
Shall we show the clip and then you talk about it? Or do you want to set it up a bit as well? I, yeah, um, should I set up this scene? That I, I was filming a dating coach who... Um, who the, the film is about women who wanted to explore their sexuality. Um, and it was sort of born out of an idea that was looking at that some, some media outlets were sort of calling it sort of a trend. Um, but... Um, so it was sort of trying to get to the heart of female sexuality as a film. So this, the woman that I was filming was a dating coach and she was sort of promoting to women this idea of exploring your sexuality. And so this is a scene that I filmed with her after she'd done a, a session in, she's in Amsterdam, and I go and film her on a night out. It's a crowd, isn't it? We have to go with oh, them. Oh, yes. Can we go? <laughs> yes, sure. I'll press my coat. You want okay. to offer something or not? Let the girl through. <laughs> <laughs> well, I took that took about five minutes to become happy. To... <laughs> what is this for? <laughs> I know. <laughs> Barry. I'm like, life is smiling on me today, isn't it? Life is saying, don't be down, Haley. Let's have fun. <laughs> I find that the relationship dynamic I experience with men and women is actually really, really different. I think when I'm with a man, I like to feel feminine. He looks after me, allows me to be the girl when I'm around him. When I'm in women, often the reverse is true. Often women will tell me that they feel protected when they're with me, that they feel safe. What happens a lot is that I'll meet a woman and I'll approach her and she'll become very attracted to me. So for some reason, even though I would argue that I potentially even slightly prefer men, the majority of my relationships have been with women. And I think there's something really interesting in that, that I haven't quite figured out yet. So clearly a very intimate film and uh, clearly a close relationship between you and the person you're filming. What, what were some of the kind of main things you felt you learnt from that process and making that piece? Um, well, I think that we... Well, in, in that scene in particular, we, we, we didn't know, obviously, that that was going to happen. Um, we, were, we were hoping that that was going to happen, but... Um, we had like we had two days filming in Amsterdam. She, she Haley said she was she was going to go out, and we were like we're going to film. We want to film that. We had access to that nightclub that she was going to film in, that, that she was going to go to. So we sort of hoped it was going to unfold like that, but we just didn't know. And it could have been, it could have been, um, you know, nothing could have happened, and it wouldn't have been a scene. It wouldn't be in the film, and I wouldn't be here talking about it now. Um, but we were, you know, I was lucky that that happened. But um, I guess you sort of have to, you, have, you sort of have to make sure that you are, you can pr predict what you might might happen, and then be prepared to wait for it. So I guess it was the, you know, what I learned was, you know, you, you do sort of have to have faith in the idea of, you know, waiting for things to happen, and you have to have you have to hold your nerve. Um, How long had you been filming by the time that you filmed that? Um, 
probably a couple of months, not loads, and we'd done the odd day filming here and there, but we knew she was doing this um, workshop in Amsterdam, so it was, it was, in, it was in the diary. Um, and I guess if that hadn't happened then, we would probably would have filmed her maybe in London again and tried to, to get a scene similar, but um, there would have been only so many times we could have done that in order to, um, you know, ha have, a, have a scene that sort of really illustrated, you know, female attraction in its early stages. Um, it feels like you built trust with her, I suppose. You know, that's what, that you'd had an opportunity to build some trust with her. Yeah, we ha we, we'd, we'd, we'd spent, you know, i.e. me and my AP, my assistant producer, we'd spent um, a, a bit of time filming with her. She, you know, she was happy to for that to be filmed, which is, like, the main thing. Um, she was confident enough in herself. She was confident enough in what she was doing. She was confident enough in... Um, what she, you know, was embracing about the filming that that she was happy to let that unfold and, and allow me to film that, you know, and we, I mean, you know, it, we were, I mean, maybe you can tell from that, but we were like obviously hanging back. We're not like up in their faces, sort of filming. Um, but you know, you, 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 but in order to get that level of intimacy, you, you sort of, you need to be able to slip in the back into the background for the people that you're filming to forget you, that you're there, but then uh, when they, you know, inevitably, you, you know, people know that you're there at certain points, but for, for that not to be distracting and for that to, you know, for, for, for what's happening to play out as naturally as possible in spite of you being there with a camera in their face. So I'd say there's a, a theme through your work of building trust with people and filming very sensitive things. Um, so um, we're going to show another clip from a film about Tony Slattery, um, the actor and comedian. I'd say it's really intimate. Um, and I'll ask Claire to set it up before we show the clip. And then after the clip, maybe we can take a couple of questions um, from the room before we move on to the next stuff. So would you like to tell us a bit about this film and how it came about? Um, and why the clip, why you want to show yeah. this particular clip? Um, so this film came about um, because there was an article, there was an article in, the Gu in The Guardian about Tony Slattery who, when I was sort of 15, 16, 17, he was on a show called um, Whose Line Is It Anyway? And he was quite a prolific a comedian who I uh, had really fond memories of because um, he was so good. And this article came out which was about um, how he'd um, sort of suffered with depression and, alcohol and alcoholism for um, and decades. And he was, he was, he looked entirely different from this sort of vivacious, sort of bright young thing, having come out of Cambridge Footlights, um, you know, 20, 30 years earlier. And the, f the film was funded by... Um, BBC Science, so it was a um, it was a science commission. So it, it 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 needed to have a sort of structure that was science focused. So we you know decided to make a film that was about how do you get diagnosed um, with a, what's the diagnosis process like if you have a, men, a mental health um, condition and. Um, because it was um, about very complex mental health um, issues, it was particularly sensitive and sort of, we needed to be sort of very aware of what the process was and whether that was going to be something that, you know, Tony wanted to and should do. So we consulted, you know, a lot of psychiatrists before uh, filming this scene and, and, and obviously Tony himself, um, uh, you know about whether it was something that he wanted to do, and we we knew that there was something that was w you know could potentially unfold, um, but um, w you know it was only it was it was a, it was going to have to come from him if he felt in the moment that he wanted to 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 use that opportunity if you want to think about it like that um, to to do that, and he was Tony was very motivated about 
you know, making sure that people with mental health, complex mental health problems were felt like they weren't alone and that there was sort of a greater cause involved in him exploring his own personal issues. So it's a very sensitive um, scene. So, you know, um, it's a slight warning uh, about, about it. What a beautiful day. Wow. And what a beautiful building. Oh, hello, Kieran. Hello, Before leaving Belfast, Tony and Mark decide to consult Professor Kieran Mulholland from Queen's University. He's one of the leading experts in this area of childhood trauma and mental health. Though it's likely to be incredibly intimate, Kieran and Tony both agree to allow for the session to be filmed. I'm a consultant psychiatrist. I know you've met a number of psychiatrists on your journey in the last few weeks and over the years. Mm -hmm. uh, it was at your show last night, which lasted nearly two hours, so I do feel I know quite a lot about you on the basis of that show. Mm -hmm. I've read... Two hours, sorry about that. Oh, it was very good. I really, really enjoyed it. The purpose of this conversation is more to discuss specific issues around trauma. And okay. How, and how trauma might have affected you through your life. And the purpose of this is not just to talk about it for the sake of talking about it, not to relive it, just for the sake of reliving it, the traumatic experiences, I mean, but to try and understand just how important it might be and to try and determine whether a focused therapeutic approach, a talking therapy, might be helpful at this point, okay. this point in your life. Does that make sense? Absolutely. It was the Guardian interview earlier this year, which I read, and you did mention specifically an incident with a priest at the age of eight. So that doesn't sound good. Uh, and it's hard. Might as well cut to the chase. Yes. It's hard to imagine that, that could have had anything but a negative impact on your life. Well, it wasn't pleasant, no. Uh, being fucked up the arse at the age of eight, no, it was not. OK, so that's what we're talking about, it's as bad as that. Well, that's what happened. OK. Um, whether... <laughs> whether that baggage still is on my shoulders at the age of 60, I don't know. Do you shrug off baggage or... I mean, I might as well be frank. Have you ever talked about this before in the way you've just talked about it in the last mm -hmm. two minutes? With Mark. You haven't actually sort of oh. been that specific. You didn't tell your, your, your parents. Oh, God, no. So you kept it secret? Yes. Yeah. That happened more than once, Tony? Uh, uh, uh. Yeah, but I... C c yeah, but I can only remember the first time. Or choose n not to try and remember the first time. OK. I've often thought that to blame everything on what happened when, uh, when I was eight, I'm not sure, I'm not sure about that. OK. There's seldom one single cause for anything. Mm. It's, it's a combination. Sometimes there's something in our genes, in our inheritance, it's important. Uh, clearly using a lot of cocaine was important. But I do wonder if the traumatic experience at the age of eight is perhaps of more importance than everything else, without saying that it explains everything, but of central importance. OK. How does one address it? What do you do? Do you put it, do you put it in a kind of psychological waste paper bin and say, that was then? So what? No, uh, I think what you do uh, is you address it with modern forms of therapy which are very focused. Not something I've talked about until now. Uh, I've shelved it, I think, for a long time, I think. You do? Refer to it more than you think you do sometimes. Ah. Oh. So it, I think it is what chopping, you, chopping you more than you think, because it's um, it serves as 
when you do conversation you talk shows and things and and you touch on it but then you sort of go past it so I think it's it's there more than you think okay I think lately definitely okay I'm so fucking worried that this is um a self-indulgence talking about it. Well, it is definitely not. Like, yeah. That's not the case, I don't think. I don't think that. Mark doesn't think that. That's mm. not the case, don't he? Mm. It's about your well-being and your happiness. I, I think the very fact that you think that and that you feel guilty is a reflection of what's happened. It's caused by that. From all those years ago? From all those years ago. Jesus. It's quite likely you've carried guilt with you ever since. In quite a profound way, which has meant that you've been quite self-destructive, as opposed to self-indulgent. As well as what happened in the past, address the present and been in a healthier place, which will allow you to go forward. But at some point you have to take the first step in that journey. Maybe it's now. Um, there is a way forward. Okay. And so, so you need to believe, first of all, that, that it's necessary, and then, then believe that it's possible. Oh. You know, if I want to do something, uh, I believe there is something that can be done. Oh. Uh, Does that sound like a problem? <laughs> no, no, it's, it's just never been put to me yeah. like that before. Ha, huh. thank you. Uh, yeah. Sorry about that. Uh, I don't know. You know it's stuff. Stuff. Came up. Long time coming. I think. I don't know. Really. Is it? Uh, mm -hmm. Congratulations. I mean, it feels like there was a real genuine moment of revelation in that scene. And I just, I know you talked a bit about your approach before you filmed it, but you know, what, what happened after you'd filmed it, both for you and also for Tony Slattery and, and then also after it aired, I suppose, you know, cause mm. there's different stages in that. Um, well, immediately afterwards, um, you know, he was exhausted, and, and he'd been he'd done a, he'd done a show, um, a comedy show, the, the night before. So immediately afterwards, he, he went he went home and sort of rested, and then we didn't we didn't we sort of gave him a bit of space um, before we did anything else. He we had in place a he was speaking to a sort of psychiatrist as part of the filming process that was um, that he could. Uh, call on at any point during the filming and up to broadcast and then after broadcast. Um, you, know, he, you know, we were, you know, able to film and provide that support with him whilst we were making the production. Um, I, I mean, and then some of that support went beyond it, but in terms of, you know, he was also in the system, you know, in the, in the um, NHS system. Um, and you... Which is, and it's easy to fall through the cracks, and so you need, it's hard, he needed to ask for and be provided the sort of really specialist help, but really, really want it. Um, so he, he didn't go on to do talking therapy that was specific to childhood trauma afterwards, uh, which we all wanted him to, and, 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 and so did his partner. But um, he found that the process of doing the filming, um, you know, something that, that he, you know, looked back on that sort of helped him at that moment in his life, like move forward slowly. You know, I'm, I'm sure everyone's aware that complex mental health problems are really hard to, you know, TV just doesn't solve that. Um, it, 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 it sort of, it's, it, it hoped to inform him and his partner about what tools they could use uh, to, to go forward. Um, and help other people understand what the impact of childhood trauma is. Um, but yeah, he, he, you know, he, he, you know, he, he, he was pleased and proud to have been part of that program. Um, and his, and I think his, and his partner was 
uh, who, you know, we, we also obviously consulted, you know, at length before we did, we did anything with, with Tony, uh, we, you know, was happy that the process sort of gave him, you know, motivation. And did, what did you learn as a filmmaker, do you think, from that process? Um, what did I learn? I, I mean, it was really, really challenging, difficult film to make that was, you know, heartbreaking. Um, I th when I came out of that film, I thought I really need to make a film about preventative <laughs> mental health um, issues with, you know, young, young, younger people, you know, young children or, you know, teenagers, because, you know, it felt to me that the, the way that I could, um, you know, looking at preventative health was, would, would be more hopeful than um, looking at complex mental health problems because they're sort of they're difficult to see uh, progress and, um, you know, really happy outcomes because it's just desperately hard. Shall we take some questions from... There, so there's um, a hand up here. Hi, Claire. Um, my name's Bessie. I am just graduated this year. I'm really interested in going to documentary. Um, I wanted to ask, why did you pursue self-shooting and how do you juggle the responsibilities of shooting, producing, directing? How do you decide what to delegate to your team? Hmm. Um... That's a good question. Thank you, Betty. Um, I, I I had a real desire to want to shoot. You know, I, I I'd sort of done f photography as a hobby up up until the point I sort of got got into TV. And and when I it was the early two thousands, and there was a lot of it was sort of at that point where the industry was you needed to be multi skilled to get the work. Um, so self being able to self shoot was was going to be beneficial and, and, and increase my chances of getting getting work. And luckily, I just really wanted to shoot because I, I do really love it. Um, and it is really difficult to be, you know, especially sort of a scene like that, to be shooting it and, you know, listening to it, making sure the sound's going on. You're like, oh, my God, is Tony OK? And have I got the shot in focus? And what's going to happen next? I don't know. And it's really challenging to um scene um i think you to you de you delegate or how do you make that easier i think you have a really um you, you trust the people around you to be supporting you and you I, that that scene required just there were two people in the room just me and me and um my ap who was booming um so it wouldn't have been appropriate, I don't think, to have another, to have a cameraman in, to, or camera woman, um, to sh to shoot it. But um, I, you know, late, you know, now it's it's really, I find it really um, beneficial to be working with a DOP, who, because you that that part of your brain that's concentrating on the on the, all the visuals all the time you can just concentrate on the directing making sure that relationship with your uh, contributor is is really strong and make that you know your entire focus is that it's it make, basically makes it easier um, but um, there are some times that you know you, you have that intimacy with just you and one other person in the room you know creates an intimacy that you would you you wouldn't get otherwise so it, I think it depends on the situation um, Depends on how much money's in the budget as well. Crucially. Yeah, <laughs> crucially, yeah. Hi, I'm Yi Chao, I'm a first year film student. I just wanted to ask, what's the industry like on the market like for experimental documentaries and experimental films? Well, I, I would say that it's challenging um, to make experimental films. I think that um, TV documentaries, you know, there's a, there's a, commer there's a commercial sort of, incent you know, imperative um, so you broadcasters only commission stuff that they know people are going to watch um, I think there are lo lots of um, outlets that you can look at if you want to make experimental films because there's a really healthy um, short film festival circuit and there are um, the short films that will be 
short film festivals that were specifically looking for experimental work. Um, so you need to seek that out. And if I, I and I know somebody who makes experimental films. So if you come and find me afterwards, I can give you his name and you can have a look at his website because he is excellent. But yeah, it's niche. I, you know, got to be honest. But I'd say there's also a lot of access to, you know, phones and ed software editing at home and all those kind of tools that maybe didn't used to exist, so which definitely help with one's own creative expression of experimental film. Um, so, so leading on from um, self-shooting, mm -hmm. um, how do you create your kind of visual language? How do you create your style? And um, what's your creative approach to your films? I think my, you know, primarily I'm, inter I'm interested in making sure that I understand the person I'm filming and what it is that I'm there filming for and making sure that that person trusts the process and trusts me. So that gives the films a layer of intimacy and a texture that is its, in, you know, is the, is the style. Um, so. I, you know, I then would be using prime lenses to make it sure that it sort of it looks as good as it, it can look. Um, so it's sort of a combination of intimacy and using um, using ca cameras and lenses that would like help elevate it to something that feels as cinematic as possible. So you worked on a series. You moved from a single film to series. Yeah. Um, and I think this was a series following a family or following four families over three years, which in itself is quite a big feat. Yes, yeah, yeah. Yes, it, I, I mean, it was a series. I was one of four directors making involved in making um, a film about the, a family that we filmed over three years. Um, yeah, it was meant to be... It was. This is a classic example of, like, you know, TV really. <laughs> we were, we. The idea was it was sort of it was. I don't know whether you or any of you remember Boyhood, that um, drama that was filmed over twelve years. It was incredible. Um, so it was sort of born out of that. And Sky at the time were trying to not do so much sport. They wanted to do docs, and so they had this pot of money that. Um, meant that they could, because you don't get the opportunity to film somebody for five years, it just doesn't happen. It, you know, even three years, you know, from where I'm sat now is extraordinary. But it was meant to be a five year project and it was going to be sort of, to make a 90 minute film, but sort of two and a half years in, Sky decided that they weren't so interested in, you know, this anymore. And they basically said, we'll just make, let's just make one hour films, which for Sky, with the advert breaks is like 47 minutes. Um, so it was, yeah, it was, it was a bit, it was basically really gutting because I was like, we, you know, the sort of the ambition of, of the series was the thing that I was interested in. Um, but uh, it ended up being three years and, um, you know, it was, it, it's, even though it doesn't, doesn't have the, the length, it's still got the intimacy and it's still got the sense of time and it's still got, um, it still sort of gets the heart of a subject that, you know, I, if I didn't have the three years, I probably wouldn't have got to. So, it, you know, it, 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 it sort of, um, it's a film I'm really proud of because, um, because I had the time to get the intimacy, which, yeah, it's limited, more and more limited these days. So the series called The Borgs? The, yeah, the, the series is called This Is Our Family, and so this, this my episode is called The Borgs. Balls. Okay, shall we show a clip from the Borgs? Doing your daughter at that age? I didn't carry on. I couldn't do it. She's stronger than I am. Why are you not? Yeah, cheers. Yeah, Has it got any easier with Zana? No, it's got worse. 
It's got worse. Yeah, knowing that one of them's getting out next year is... I suppose that makes it harder as well. It's like... His life goes on now. Feels like... It don't matter, it's over with now. But it's not. How's Emma doing? Because one of the boys is coming out of prison. Um, she's struggling, I think. Um, she keeps... She holds a lot back. Sometimes I wake up in the morning, she's not there. Go to the top of the stairs, I can hear her downstairs in the kitchen crying. It takes a lot. It takes all my strength to pretend and try to be normal and just have a normal day. I'm aware that they're coming out. I'm dreading Emma walking around town and bumping into one of them because she's not going to be able to tolerate seeing them free. They live in the same area. One of them, their parents, lives just on the other side of the cemetery. What does that feel like? To be honest, I drive past their house and I feel resentful. Their kids did something and mine paid the price. So will you tell us, this is, you know, obviously the length of time you're filming and you're filming a kind of extended family. Um, how do you maintain the access? Did they ever want, did somebody drop out? Did you have to get people back on board? Uh, what was that like? Um, yeah, it was not, not easy because I'm sort of two, two hours drive away. And you, unless you're there, you don't really know what's happening. So often we would get there and realise, oh, God, it would be so much better if we were here two days ago. Um, and then you're sort of, so you're on the back foot all the time, which is why my questions sort of ended up being in it, because it helps, they help sort of drive the narrative um, when you're, you're catching up. Um, and, you know, Emma... I probably should have sort of prefaced that because it wasn't quite. It's not. Wasn't always easy to to understand Tony at the beginning of that clip. But you know, he he um, was basically talking about her strength, and so whenever I was coming back to the house, it w I would have to work out. You know how appropriate it was to talk to Emma about how she was doing, because you know if if she wasn't. She wasn't doing okay. Then it it wasn't you know appropriate for me to be asking her questions about grief. But but equally, in order to understand how difficult it is to grieve for a daughter, you did I I did need to be asking her questions so that it you know it, it you you could understand what she was going through and she did want to um, talk about it because it ultimately it, she wasn't talking to loads of other people so it was, you know, the, the filming with me did become an outlet for her to at least process a, a part of it. Um, but yeah, no, I mean there were, you know, times when Emma was... I wanted to, for example, I wanted to film her just the night before she got married because her, 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 her and Tony got married in the process of the filming, which was at least a really lovely storyline to follow. And, um, yeah, I wanted to film her the night before she... night before the wedding. And so I, I was sitting outside the house because I was there at the time that she said, and it was sort of clearly she, she decided against it, but... Um, and. So she hadn't, hadn't responded to a text. So I was like, okay, well, I'll just wait. And then I sort of waited and waited and waited and waited. And I was like, oh, um, um, it's, it's, yeah. And then sort of left at a certain point because it was clearly not happening. And she wanted that moment to, for herself, uh, you know, which isn't entirely, entirely fair enough. Because, you, you know, you, you're sort of constantly having to sort of troubleshoot whilst filming, you know. You, your, your ideal is this, but if you don't 
get it, then what is another way of ha having the same content or the same feeling or the same point, but in another way, which is, ends up, you know, it's half your life when you're filming is sort of like juggling these sort of various options and, and not quite sure what you're going to get, but, but sort of trying to put yourself in the best position so you can, you can get something and not miss it. Um, but so she, I went round in the morning and, and filmed a lo like lovely scene with her in her sort of, you know, dressing gown, getting ready and for the wedding. And it was really lovely, and it was just as, just the same. It just wasn't the, the night before. Um, but yeah, no, there was time. There were times during, you know, you're aware that people, you know, are, you know, they want you there, but then there becomes a point where they don't want you there anymore, and you need to be really, you know, tuned into that so that. Um, you, especially when you're filming people over three years, that you you know you can you can keep coming back and asking for people's time and energy and effort. Um, so yeah, it's you just it's as much about when you put the camera down as when you pick it up. Um, and what happens with your relationship with some of the people that you've been filming? Because I keep coming back to this word intimate, but you sort of you're quite committed in people's lives, and at what point does that end for you, or how do you, mm. do you get very emotionally invested? Do you, mm. how do you professionally make the separation? Mm. Um, I mean, some, it's diff different, like some people I'm, you know, I'm, I'm still friends with lots of people I've filmed with, and um, we'll see them or speak to them, and, and some people not. Um, you know, I'm, in, I'm still in touch with the, the Borgs, and, um, you know, I, I, you know, went round there, you know, recently, and they'd invite me to a, something that's happening, and I'll I'll go because I'm I'm not that far away from them now. Um, but with some some people, you know, it's it's been a process. It's very intimate, and then that's that's it, and um, it's all something that you know that that the person who's been involved in the filming is sort of glad to be taken has have taken part in, but then they move on with their life, just like. I move on, on with on with mine, but um, it's you know it's like any relationship really. Some you know some relationships are stronger than the others, and some some of them last and some of them don't. But it's 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 definitely not a case of like you step into someone's life and then you step out of it. You just don't. Um, you're um, you know you 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 inevitably build an intimacy and a friendship that's real, that's um, that, that 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 lasts to some extent. Clearly a responsibility. Um, are there some more questions? Should we take some more questions? Hi, um, my name's Alice. I'm studying journalism at Goldsmiths. I was just wondering how you deal with like feeling like you're invading on someone's life if like the point that they don't want you there with the camera. Um, like how do you deal with that? And like, like especially the scenes in the club in Amsterdam, I felt like that was very like a very intimate moment. Do you ever feel like you're kind of stalking people just there like filming stuff? Um, yeah, I mean, you, def you definitely feel like you're, you know, you're, you're s sort of hanging, sometimes you're sort of hanging around like a bad smell and you have to overcome that because people, you know, if, if, if people don't want you there, they let you know. Um, and you don't film people that don't want to be filmed. Um, but in, if, if people, you know, it's about, you know, in, informed consent. So people making sure that people absolutely understand what it is you're doing, why, why you're doing it, what the outcome is going to be. And, you know, they sign up to a process and over time um, you develop a relationship that um, you both, you're both committed to. So sometimes you have to take a break from filming. And people don't want to do any more filming and you'll go, right, that's, that's absolutely fine. And then you pick it up at another moment. Um, but it's a, you know, it's, a, it's a process of negotiation and a, and a process of conversation that you need to be on top of in order to make a film that has, is going to say something and has some meaning and takes people on a journey and is telling a story. Um, yeah, but it's not, it's not always easy. Um, yes, uh, thank you. I'm Anton Gash. I'm, I'm studying at the British Forces Broadcasting Service Academy. Um, thank you for, for those uh, beautiful films from uh, obviously very impressive um, uh, clips from uh, very impressive films. My uh, question is related to the last one. How do you balance the, the risk of you becoming um, an, an intruder 
um, in, in the scene. I, I don't think you were at all, um, and you, you were exactly the right side of the, of the balance, but there was a moment where Tony Slattery, he was clearly sort of talking to you, where, where, where he was saying, well, you know, I might as well be frank about it. Um, and, and, and equally in your um, Amsterdam scene, um, you know, to what extent does the camera incite the, the incident, or does it actually mm. create the, the, the atmosphere? How do, how do you judge that, and how do you hold mm. back from it? Um, yeah, I mean, you, you're, you're constantly sort of having to be attuned to sort of wanting things to unfold naturally in front of you so that it's real and authentic, and uh, making sure that your contributors you know, happy with you being there at times that feel, um, you know, quite feel private. Um, but it, it, it sort of comes back to that um, question of, you know, what, what you, you know, making sure you're very transparent. You know, Haley, Haley was like, we're, we're, we'd like to film you on a night out, you know, you know, if, if, you know, on a night out, if you're going out and you're going out on the pool, are you happy for us to be there and witness that and film it? And she was invested in the idea of, um, a, you know, a transparency around female sexuality and, a, again, giving women the confidence and men to uh, explore and be freer in the way that they thought about themselves sexually. So there was a motivation for her to allow me to film that that she was invested in and wanted to happen as well. Um, and then when you're, when, you know, when we were there, the, 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 the girl that she was with, we, after she'd just met her, we obviously had a, con we went, we took her to the side and was like, well, we're here and we're filming and we're making a film for Channel 4 about female sexuality. We're going to be, we're filming Hayley this evening. Are you happy for us to be there? Um, and then, you know, she said yes, so we carried on filming, and then it sort of unfolded like that. And it, it's a balance between not getting in people's faces and pissing them off, and, um, and, 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 and knowing when to put the camera down is... Um, so I could have... They went on, probably, you know, they went on for the rest of the evening, but I was with them for two hours of an evening that was much longer. So... Yeah, it's it's uh, it's sort of understanding when you've got the point of the scene, and then you need to say thanks very much. We're off. Um, with Tony, he looks at the camera quite purposefully, um, and he's doing that because he wants to acknowledge the camera's there. And he's um, in. And and when he did that, he was basically saying, "I'm happy for the ca the camera to be there because uh, he he didn't want to pretend that um, it wasn't." Um, being filmed, I think. So it's quite conscious and uh, adds, uh, adds to the idea that it, there was a consent involved in that, getting that scene. Great. Would you like to ask a question? Um, hi, I'm Marge. I'm a filmmaking student at the Royal Conservatory of Scotland. Uh, it was really noticeable how much the people trust you uh, and invite you into to these sort of very personal moments. And you mentioned earlier on that building that trust was very important. I, I'm just wondering, could you tell me a bit more about the process? Because it seems like that starts way before you even start filming. Mm. And, and how, do you, how do you go about doing that with them? Um, I think you have to, you know, you sort of have to be really transparent and you have to be, you know, you, you, you can't be hiding anything and you can't be hiding who you are. Like, so, I, you know, people trust me because I'm honest with them and I'm open about what I'm doing and I'm, there's no particular sort of, you know, um, edge to it in, 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 a, in a way that would make people suspicious. And, and it's not like I'm going into someone's house and say, you need to like me and trust me because otherwise this isn't going to work. It happens over time, and you have to be invested in what you're doing and want to be there, because you do, you like, you, you have to, you have to be that. In order to have, be able to have the opportunity to, to build scenes like that into films, you, you have to, um, you have to be everything that you say you are, so that people allow you to be there. Um, and that, 
Um, that's just about being real, I think. Um, but also being professional um, and making sure that people understand what the point of you being there is. And that's, you know, having time to talk to people off camera and spending time people with people off camera so that it's not just I tip up, I turn the camera on and then I leave and say thanks very much. It's, it's, it's more than that. Um, and that means you have to invest yourself. So, yeah, there's a, there's a you know, that there's, you have to really want to do it, which is how you sort of get it in a way. If that makes sense. We're almost out of time. Um, I just wanted to let the audience know as well a bit about... So Claire's been absolutely seminal in the last couple of years setting up an organisation called We're Doc Women, uh, which I signed up to right at the beginning as well, but was a real breath of fresh air for a lot of female filmmakers, but also generally underrepresented filmmakers. Um, so really quickly, because we've only got about 30 seconds, tell us why you set it up and what you feel it's achieved and how people can find out about it. Um, well, yeah, so we're called We Are Doc Women. I set it up, so I got to a point in my career and I looked back and I was like, God, um, how did that happen? You know, how, how did I do it? Because I've obviously had the privilege of making films, single films that aren't easy to get and, um, you know, managed to sustain myself over a career and, um, and, and it's not easy. Um, and you get to a point where you see... You, I sort of realised how hard it was, but also realised that I, you know, often, you know, you 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 basically see, you know, male male directors sort of shooting up the ladder, and getting, you know, bigger, better jobs. Often, not always, and being able to sustain a career with the sort of landmark films. Um, and so I thought, gosh, I'm I'm in a position where I'm sort of, you know, I'm getting really good good opportunities that I'm grateful for. But, you know, how do you, as a woman director or as a, you know, a director from an underrepresented group or who uh, is from a socio different socioeconomic background, how on earth do you make it work? Um, so I started talking to my peers and we sat in my lounge <laughs> and, you know, in 2017 and started chatting, like, is this, is this, how do we all feel about it? Is it real? What do we do about it? Are these challenges perceived or are they real? Um, and we ended up doing a survey which highlighted the, that it was real. And then we ended up, um, you know, having a recommendation that was basically a pledge for companies to sign up to, which we called the 50-50 pledge. And, you know, um, amazingly, and this is all very shorthanded, this happened over a lot of time with a lot of people and... Um, a lot of work, but we ended up with a lot of the industry, like 70 companies, some broadcasters, Amazon Prime signed up, signing up to the idea that if we look at the numbers, then we will make the difference because we're focused on the numbers. And if you can give people stats that show the inequalities, and if the industry talks about wanting to do something about inequality around diversity and inclusion, then if you give them facts then and offer solutions, you know, when there's will, you... you we, you know, you can, you can make a difference. So it, it, you know, I started in my lounge with like six people and now there's two and a half thousand people in the group. Um, um, so if, yeah, if you look, if you look uh, for We Are Dot Women, you can see our survey report where all the stats are and you can, you know, you're welcome to join the face, Facebook group. Um, um, it's a really amazing group of, of women who have... Uh, loads and loads and loads of experience and um, all trying to help because it re we realised it sort of just ended up plugging a gap, you know, of support within the um, industry which can sometimes feel quite isolating, quite difficult, quite challenging to, you know, continually sort of as a freelancer sort of pitch for work. So it, it sort of took on a life it's, of its own and, and it's now sort of established as a support group and we do some campaigning and we have social events and we, you know, we, 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 we welcome men to come to our social events. It's, we, we, you know, we, it's all about inclusion. So we don't, you know, we don't want um, to exclude men at all, but we, you know, we want men to be part of the conversation that is about parity, basically. And it's a great network. People are always posting, I need this, I need that. How do I do this? How do I do that? And 
um, yeah, yeah, it's been a great forum. So I think, I think we're at time. Anyone confirming that? Um, but I just want to say thank you so much for <laughs> <laughs>